So hello, everybody, and welcome to the best free one-hour security awareness training ever, not to put any pressure on ourselves or anything, but we are hoping to deliver what everybody here will experience as the best free one-hour security awareness training ever. Uh, if you're not familiar with GoToWebinar, just very quickly, if you enter questions into the at the bottom of your GoToWebinar control panel, there's a place there to give questions to us. We will be doing our best to get to those questions throughout and at the end of the webinar. We cannot promise that we'll get to all questions. We also have, will endeavor to leave a few minutes at the end of the webinar for Q&A where we can unmute people and let folks talk, but everybody is going to be muted by default throughout the webinar. We're here uh, on video just for the first few minutes, and then we'll see you again at the end, but you will hear Dusty and I's lovely voices throughout. I'm Joshua Pesky, Vice President of Roundtable. I also have with me Destiny Bowers. Hi, I'm Destiny Bowers. I'm our Client Relation Manager and Project Manager. And uh, so let's get started and learn a little bit about security. And behind the scenes, we also have Ben Gardner, who's uh, handling all the tech and also is in charge of all snarky comments that need to be added uh, to Dusty and I's uh, webinar. So off we go. So icebreaker. We're going to start with a, with a nice quick survey for everybody. So we've got this nice little cartoon, the security desk and the insecurity desk. And as we go on to the, uh, to the first poll, what we want to ask everybody here is... At which desk do you feel like you belong? Do you feel like you're at the security desk or do you feel like you're at the insecurity desk? Sorry, I was a little slow on that. I forgot that I'm doing polls for this one. And we're going to let everybody uh, throw comments. So which desk everybody is at? We'll leave this open for just a few more seconds. We've got most folks have voted. Five, four, three, two, one. And it's a kind of a 50-50 split. So we've got... A, and it's almost exactly a 50-50 split, so kind of interesting. Uh, so we've got some people here at the webinar feeling quite uh, secure and some people feeling not so secure. So we're hoping by the end we're going to change those numbers for everybody. Okay, so moving on to uh, the very next slide. Why are we here today? Well, cybersecurity can seem overwhelming, complex, scary, but what we're going to be talking about today is how much it's mostly about people and behavior. And it turns out that there are some pretty basic things you can do to make both yourself and your organization significantly more secure. And one of the great benefits of security awareness training for organizations is that it helps the security not just of your organization, but of the individuals. So when you're giving your staff security training, you're not just helping your organization, but they're less likely to be victims of identity theft, of other kinds of fraud, of security breaches within their own personal uh, you know, computers and devices. So you're helping the individuals that work at your organization as well as your organization itself. And as we go on to the next slide, we're going to just quickly, what we're going to cover today is that who is after your information, why they want your information, how they get your information. And those things we're going to be covering pretty quickly because we believe that to make this the best free one-hour security awareness training ever, we really need to focus on that fourth bullet point, which is what you can do to make yourself more secure. So that's that's where the bulk of this is going to be today. But we did want to kind of set some groundwork for everybody, and then we'll, we'll have some next steps that people can take. Next slide, we're going to make a promise to you, and, and the promise is that no FUD. So what is FUD? FUD is Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt, which is shorted to that acronym, which is a disinformation strategy that can be used by organizations like Roundtable, if we were unscrupulous, uh, to, to kind of scare people and providing misinformation in order to convince you that you have to hire our services or buy our product in order to alleviate some risk that you may or may not have. And the information we are presenting today is not that. All right, We are doing our absolute best to present what we see as the legitimate risks and where you don't have risks. Uh, so having said that, as we go on to our, our next slide here with the little Larry David, having said that, we do want everyone to be aware of what threats there are out there in the world and what they can do to protect themselves. We also want you to understand that you can't eliminate all risk. One look at the news, right? We got a LinkedIn breach that, that hit the news yesterday. Now, it was back in 2012, so anyone who hasn't changed their LinkedIn password since 2012 
does have cause for concern today, but hopefully uh, no one at this webinar fits into that, that category, but you will see breaches in the news all the time, all right? So you can't eliminate all risk, but there are things that you can do that can make a big difference. And we're going to revisit this slide toward the end of the webinar when we've kind of given you the tools and tactics and, and strategies to, to implement these things at your organization. So you can nurture a security culture at your organization. We're going to talk today a lot about what that means, and attending this webinar is a great first step in that, in that process. You can educate yourself and others about the tactics used to steal your info and the information we're going to give today will give you a lot of that. We're, you can protect your accounts and devices with secure practices. Now we can't do that for you today, but we will give you some strategies and tools to protect your accounts and your devices. And you can verify. A couple of uh, months ago we did a webinar called Tame Your Inbox, which was about inbox management, and we provided in there the one word security training, and that one word was verify. Verify. And, I, verify. <laughs> and if, if there's one thing you take away from today's webinar about security awareness, it is that when in doubt, any doubt, verify. And we'll, we'll talk a lot about what that means today. And I think that is where I hand things to nope, Dustin. Nope, you're on a little oh, more. Nope, I'm still on for three more slides. All right, I was trying to hand. All right. Oh, that's right. The three slides of boring stuff. All right, so <laughs> if anyone wants to take a quick nap or anything like that, we're going to go <laughs> three slides of boring stuff. And we're going to talk in a little bit of detail about cybersecurity because it's a term we all see. Uh, it was used in the promotion of this webinar today. And so we think it's important to contextualize. It's only three slides. We're going to go fast. So you can, if you need to take a little bathroom break or something, this might be a great time. Otherwise, if you really want to learn a little bit about cybersecurity, here we go. All right, let's start with the definition. What is cybersecurity? It's the protection of an organization and its assets from electronic attack to minimize the risk of business disruption. All right, so we're, it's the protecting the electronic stuff. We will talk in this webinar today about paper stuff, stuff that falls outside of the, you know, technical rubric of cybersecurity, but it's primarily concerned about protecting electronic information. So where do people fit into cybersecurity? So let's think about this. If we look at this triads, so we're going to give you two triads in a row, and this is, remember, the boring stuff. All right, so there's the kind of, as we're thinking about security, we're thinking about the physical protections. We have locks on the doors, we have locks in the security cabinets, we have around the filing cabinets in the server room. Uh, we have physical protection spaces, maybe you have security guards, and you have people and the people and practices and the, the policies that they are implementing are helping with security. And then you have the cyber security, which is all the technical stuff that we think of as a bunch of highly sophisticated technical people, coders, uh, security professionals, people with all kinds of certifications after their name. And the reality is that people are in all of these places. So people fit in everywhere within the thinking about security for your organization, whether it's cyber security or not. That's a really important concept to understand. All right, next slide. We're going to look at another triad, and this is uh, going to be even more boring, but I think it's, it's an important concept to, to explain, which is that as you think about information that you're trying to protect within your organization, this CIA, which is super easy to remember, right? Uh, security triad, which stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And the easiest way to think about this is when you have a piece of information, the confidentiality is how bad would it be if that information was exposed. So if you think of something like your website, not bad at all. In fact, it is exposed. It is designed to be exposed. You want that information to be public. On the other hand, if it's personal health information or credit card numbers, it'd be pretty bad if that was exposed, and you certainly don't want them out on your website. Second, how bad would it be if information was lost. So if we go back to the website here, pretty bad. If you lost all of the data and all of the designs and graphics and everything on your website and it wasn't recoverable, for most organizations here, I think they would consider that to be pretty bad. Uh, so it's not at all bad if your website is exposed, but it's really bad if the information is lost. And then the third thing to think about is availability. So how bad would it be if the information was not available for some period of time? So again, if your website was unavailable for an hour, not great, but for most of us not a catastrophe. Down for a day, starts to get pretty bad. Down for a week, 
starts to get borderline catastrophic for a lot of organizations. So those three areas are really important to think about in terms of how important information is to protect. And that is the end of our three boring slides. You all made it. Is anybody still here? Wow, we didn't lose anybody. Fantastic. All right. And now I hand off to Destiny. Take it away. <laughs> okay. So one of the terms that you will hear us mention, and you've probably heard on your own before this, is phishing. And phishing is the attempt to acquire your sensitive information, password, credit cards information, and other items like that, masquerading as trustworthy sites, be it via email or a redirection to a website, and in a lot of cases, even text messages. And if you're curious why phishing starts with a PH, it's because some of the earliest hackers out there were known as freaks with a PH. And this is because they exploited telecom systems. And since phone starts with a PH, you, well, you can guess the rest, and the PH just carried the tradition on. So now a lot of these terms will use the PH for phishing or anything with the sound. And this also moves into the concept of vishing, which is voice phishing, spear phishing, which is targeted phishing, and there's a couple of other different kinds too, as I mentioned, through mobile phones and through social media posts. But this is going to bring us to our first slide poll, which is a little game that we like to call fish or not a fish. And the rules of the game are, on the next slide, we're going to bring up a website, and we're going to leave it up there for a few seconds, and then ask you all to look at it and tell us if you think it's a fish, a fake website, or not a fish, a screen grab of a legitimate website. One thing you'll notice is you may see a watermark that says fish tank on the images. That does not signify whether it is a fish or not a fish. Um, that's just one of the services that helps you go through some of the training on phishing to help recognize these. So let's go ahead and bring up our website. We're going to leave this up for a few seconds. Everyone take a look at it. Okay, now let's launch the poll. And put your vote in whether or not you think it's a fish or not a fish. I think we've got about... 70% of people, we're up to 80% of people voted, we'll leave it open just for a few more seconds, and we've got about a two to three margin, I believe that is a fake website, about 37% of the people, almost, almost uh, you know, uh, a little over a third, believe that it is legitimate. Okay. And the answer is, next slide. It is a fish. And moving on, we're going to show you why it's a fish. One of the ways and some of the ways that you can look at a site and recognize what phishing looks like. So one of the first things you're going to see in the website address itself is there's no HTTPS, which means that this is not going through a secure channel. And you'll see over to the right the actual American Airlines site has the HTTPS and the browser has recognized this and authenticated it. Another thing that you'll see is the URL itself where it may be easy to spoof a web page's look such as the graphics and the words and everything else. The actual address of the page is something that's a lot harder to spoof because legitimate organizations have control over their legitimate organizational name. So when you're looking at a URL Take a look at what comes after the expected name, in this case, AA. And you would think that it would just be aaamericanairlines.com, but when you see a lot of the additional words after where it's something dot something else dot something else dot com, that can be a trigger for you that this may not be a legitimate site. And one of the other things to pay attention to is the fact that you often have typos or misspellings in these where you'll see that member is not spelled correctly. And a lot of times it's because organizations have caught on to what uh, fishers are trying to do and they will try and purchase misspellings of their own domain names to make sure that people are redirected to the correct location. On the next slide we're going to talk about 
who or what is out to get you? We know that fishing is out there in the wild and we know that this happens a lot and frequently. So who is it? Sometimes it's bad guys. Sometimes it's programs or bots created by the bad guys. Every now and then it's also bad code, which is an error in the programming language that actually creates vulnerabilities that the bad guys then exploit. And you'll see this is one of the reasons why you have things like Windows updates, or every now and then your browser will ask you to refresh it to um, put in other updates. And whenever they locate these vulnerabilities, they update the code and try and close up that hole. Uh, and then you also have your own people. This is not necessarily disgruntled or unhappy staff, but it could be because somebody's lost their equipment or their phone that has the information on it, or they're logging into other people's machines that may not have uh, proper antivirus or may already be infected with malware. And you have human error where people sometimes send the wrong information to the wrong people, be it via email or even via fax. And there's also human nature and human desire where people say, well, I really want to get on Wi-Fi, so I'm going to find an available network. It doesn't really matter if it's open or not. Or, oh, I would like to get a free program or not have to pay to do certain things. And so they bypass their common sense of going, this might not be the most secure thing to do, but it's something that I want. And now we'll talk about the why. And when it comes to the bad guys, usually the why comes down to the most common reminder, which is money. And people want to steal your data to um, make money off of your information, such as credit cards, or to sell your data to someone else, such as identity theft, to make money, or extort your data. And if you've heard of the crypto locker virus, which basically encrypts your data and holds it hostage until you pay somebody to get it back, uh, that all comes back to money. And there are people who just want to make trouble. And if you recall the Melissa virus from a couple of decades ago now, that was just to impress a girl, and we're not kidding, that's why he really did it. <laughs> so how are we going to combat the bad guys? How are we going to look at our security in a new way to help us fix this. So through the, the different terms that we're going to look at, and this is how the people get it, people get this through phishing, which we went over, social engineering, which Josh was going to talk about next, malware, which is programs that are installed on your computer to um, access your information, then there's theft, which is the physical theft of your devices, physical theft of information such as paperwork, laptops, cell phones, or even the credit card swipe, um, that the, the electronic credit card information that you have embedded in your credit card. And then there's also the error, which I mentioned, where these things are done by mistake or by tricking people into it. And then there's the actual physical theft through dumpster diving, which is big on identity theft, where people will go through mailboxes or trash to find things like credit card and bank statements, and then use those to steal your personal identity and other information. So it's always a good idea when it comes to that to make sure that you shred or safely dispose of that kind of personal health and personal financial information. And then lastly, which we also spoke about, the exploiting of the vulnerabilities in bad code or security code uh, holes in operating systems and in web browsers. And for this, I'm now going to hand off to Joshua to talk about social engineering. Thank you so much, Destiny. And social engineering is the manipulation of our human instinct to help. And it is, quite frankly, when we talked at the beginning about how so much of this is about people, all right, is that the social engineering is really how most of the security breaches are being perpetrated. And they're being perpetrated by, you know, fooling people with phishing or spear phishing attacks or with vishing, which we're about to talk about, uh, or through just, you know, calling people on the phone and getting key information from them. And we've all seen this in movies in a billion different ways. It's usually done, you know, comically in a lot of things or, or in, you know, in action movies. You know, the hero will often use social engineering to try to get themselves into a building. It's really common, uh, both in cinema and in real life, but in real life, 
life probably a little bit harder to identify. All right, so as we look at the next slide, it really is the lack of employee awareness is the most dangerous uh, social engineering threat to organizations. And you look at phishing, which is a form of social engineering, uh, those two by themselves constitute over uh, three quarters uh, of all of the, of, of the threats, to social engineering threats to organizations. So we're really hoping to make that much reduced for everybody that's in this webinar today and hopefully you'll bring this back to your organizations and your organizations can, can benefit from that reduction in risk as well. And so in the next slide we're going to take a little bit of time to go through and these are when we think about social engineering there's actually some really basic things that you can look for and one of the challenges is that all these kinds of things are, are things people, you know, like me, when I'm trying to sell you something, I might do, you know, some of these things. So I might initiate a call to you. I might offer you something for nothing. I might tell you if you don't buy this today, you know, the, the offer is going to go away. I might tell you if you don't buy this, your organization's at risk. Uh, I, you know, those are all things that, that a salesperson will do. Uh, but it can also be things that someone who's trying to take advantage of you uh, can do. And there's a great book, which is I have at the bottom there, called Gift of Fear, which has nothing to do with uh, information security, but has everything to do with personal security that deals a lot with how social engineering works and how to think about it. But the six things to get your spidey sense tingling, right? If, if it's not initiated by you, so initiation, meaning some comes to you with a request or or something they need from you, right? So that number one thing is just, and again, none of these things are a reason that you should automatically not trust the person. It's just a reason to start, you know, being on alert a little bit and kind of seeing if there, there's something to worry about here. If someone's offering you something for nothing, you won something, you will win something, you uh, can get a free something, you won this prize, and you just have to give us this information, right? That's that's a big warning sign, right? Um, urgency. If you don't, you know, give me this today or sign up today or give me this information right now, something bad will happen and you will lose out on some opportunity uh, that you that that otherwise you get. If you don't take this, other people will right now. Fear. All right. So if if you don't do this, something bad will happen to you. Something bad will happen to me. Something bad will happen to our organization, and that can be combined often with authority. So my boss your boss said this needs to happen. So if you do not give me this information, you will get in trouble with our boss. Or, or I represent uh, a, an, a big uh, government organization. And if you do not give me this information, you will be in trouble with the government. I am authorized by the government to get this, right? And then the last thing is when people want information from you that doesn't really makes sense. So if, if they start asking for your social security number, your driver's license number, your credit card information, right? Those are all things to, to kind of put you on alert. All right, and we're now going to do a wonderful little role play. And so Ben, don't forget to unmute yourself for this. And we want you to note the characteristics of this uh, little uh, fictional, but not totally fictional role, uh, phone call that we will do now. Hello. This is Ben from the IRS. You owe federal government taxes, and it is very important that you pay now, or you could be sent to prison. Um, I, I don't think I owe any taxes, but but what do I need to do? You can do wire transfer or pay by credit card on this call. Uh, you know, how do I know that you're really calling me from the IRS? Ma'am, I am government agent. You must do as I say or go to prison. If you need to, co if you need to, you can call us back at two one two five 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 zero one two three and use your social security number to look up your case. You know what? I think I'm going to go ahead and verify this information. See you in prison. Click. All right. So, in our little roundtable theater presentation here, you'll note that the caller use some of the things that we spoke about, which is they initiated the call. They gave that sense of urgency. They tried to put the fear of prison into me, and they tried to assert their authority. And even though I knew that I don't owe money to the IRS or I don't owe money to whatever credit agency might be calling, or I didn't initiate calls to Microsoft support services or anything like that, 
they can be very persistent and scare you into taking these actions. So on the next slide, what do we do if we receive a vishing call? The first one is, if you didn't initiate a call, never give out personal information in that call. Even if someone claims to be a representative from a bank or your credit card, and you will on occasion receive calls from your credit card about fraudulent charges, and they may say, we noticed this activity on your card, did you really make this purchase? Now, since they're not asking you for your credit card information, they're not asking you to ver anything, verify anything other than a purchase, whether or not you did it, then you can recognize that those may be legitimate. Um, but anytime they're asking you to then verify your card with your mother's maiden name or your social security number or your account password, that's when you start triggering the spidey senses tingling and say, I don't think that this is legitimate. Let me initiate a call back to this particular agency by looking up the information on their website or from a bank statement or other verified methods of communication. And then you go to them saying, I received this information. Please let me know if this is true or if any action needs to be taken. And you can also report these kinds of things to agencies to help eliminate them going forward. All right, so this is going to bring us into our next fish or not a fish poll. And on the next slide, you'll remember our little game rules, which is we'll put a website up and we'll leave it up for a few seconds and then launch the poll and see how everyone did. So the next website, please. Everyone take a look at that. Let us know or think about whether you think that's a real site or not. And we're going to launch up the poll. Do you think that was a fish or not a fish? And the votes are coming in. And all right, so 83% of the audience believes that it's a legitimate website and 17% believes it is fake. And what is the real answer? And the real answer is not a fish. That is actually the Con Ed website. It's just a really poorly designed website. Um, but you will have noticed in it where you saw the um, HTTPS and you saw the expected coned.com and you saw the same browser verification um, which helps you display or helps you recognize legitimate sites. Um, but on the next slide one of the other things that we want to mention is you may, if you're a Con Ed customer, have received this mailing or seen this on their website. And this is one of the in-person type of uh, events that we spoke about where there are people who will come to your door pretending to be Con Edison, Time Warner Cable, or other utility people, or sometimes even, unfortunately, medical or police services in order to gain entry to your house to, again, steal things along the lines of laptops and cell phones, other things that you may have. Um, so whenever you have someone showing up at your door who is not expected, Again, verify. Don't just look at their credentials. If it really tingles that spidey sense of, I don't know why these people are here, call and verify and make sure that they are legitimate. This is also a question of personal safety in some instances as well. And on the next slide, we're going to talk about some of the targeted items. And this is called spear phishing. Now, spear phishing is somebody targeting a specific person within your organization with information coming from a specific person. And a lot of times this information is found from your own website where you may list your officers, who your CFO is, who your ED is, and other things that will allow people to say, okay, I'm going to direct this spearfish to the finance person from the executive director in hopes that they will find it legitimate. And in this scenario, we have coming from the president of Roundtable a message to our finance person, Ben, requesting a wire transfer and asking what details they would need in hopes that Ben would reply with wire transfer information and banking information and things like that. 
if you receive an email asking for this kind of information, not through normal channels, this is something that you absolutely would want to verify and go back to the requester to say, did you really do this? Is this a legitimate transfer? And sometimes it's even recommended to set up a code word where if you are going to have any kind of request for fiscal transactions or sensitive information, that in person, face to face, you establish with the correct people if it doesn't have the word banana in it or something else, then you know that it's not really a legitimate request coming from someone within your organization. And spear phishing can happen over the phone and through the various methods that we spoke about, not just email. And Joshua little, has something very interesting to mention about this specific email. Yeah, so this specific email uh, was sent to us by someone who actually attended the Team Your Inbox webinar that we talked about uh, two months ago. And literally while they were in that webinar, uh, a person at that organization received this email purportedly from their executive director. They then came back from our webinar where we have the one word security training, which was verify, and thought, I will verify this. And they walked into their executive director's office, asked, did you just send me a request for wire transfer? The executive director said, of course I did not. Why would you ask me that? I've never even, wouldn't even know how we do a wire transfer. And the person then forwarded it to us quite proudly saying, hey, thanks for your training. And we, in fact, you know, stopped this through your one word security training verify. So we thought that was pretty great. And this is literally, other than we've changed the names, the literal email that that person got. Um, just with uh, their name in the, in the uh, two and their own executive director's name in the prime. And with that, we're going to... Uh, Let's see, what are we talking about next? Passwords. All right, so let's uh, leap into passwords. All right, so um, passwords could honestly be its own webinar, and uh, if people are interested in a sort of password, password management, uh, multi-factor authentication webinar is its own thing, uh, you, you can let us know that in the comments or in the survey afterward. Uh, for now, we're just going to do a, a fairly quick overview. So some things about passwords. First of all, length is more important than complexity. So I'd much rather you have a password that was something like, I went to the store on Thursday, period, a fully punctuated sentence, then a password like XJ9, dollar sign, dollar sign, three, which is shorter and complex, but actually much more, much easier to crack. And that leads us into passphrases, which are, you know, full sentences or phrases are great passwords. They're much easier for human beings to remember, and because it's an easy way to add length to a password, uh, it's a really good practice to use passphrases instead of these horribly complex short passwords. Um, using password managers like LastPass, Dashlane, KeePass, can hugely improve uh, your password performance. I don't want to spend too much time on it now, except to say the LinkedIn thing, which, which we'll talk about, and we've got all the LinkedIn passwords there. Um, it, most of us have passwords at, at this time, you know, well over 100 different sites, which sounds insane until you actually start looking at all the different sites for which you've created accounts and passwords. And if you use the same password in multiple places, then this uh, password breach that happened at LinkedIn or at Ashley Madison, uh, it, that password's now out there tied to your email address, and now people can try it on all the other accounts and platforms that you're on. And using password managers is a great way to keep you from reusing passwords at different places, because the password managers will tell you you're using this password somewhere else, don't use it in this place. Um, so don't reuse them, don't give them to other people, there's almost never a reason to give your password to someone else, and this is another great thing about password managers is they give you a secure way to share your credentials with someone else. For example, um, if I'm working on GoToWebinar uh, and I want to have Ben log into my GoToWebinar account, but I have a password that, you know, is my own private password that I use for my GoToWebinar, but we both use LastPass. Well, I can share my password with him on LastPass without him actually seeing the password. So his LastPass will then log him into my GoToWebinar account without him ever actually seeing what the password was. Then he can go do whatever it was that, that he needed to do in my GoToWebinar account. And when he's done, he lets me know and I revoke the shared password. And now I've given him access to the system, revoked access to the system, never had to share a password with him. You can't do that unless you're using password managers. 
Um, and then the last thing is don't do what 120,000 people on Ashley Madison did who are probably trying to remain private, uh, but not too hard because they had one, two, three, four, five, six as their password. And at LinkedIn, 750,000 people in 2012 had the password of one, two, three, four, five, six. And what we're going to talk about next is multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor is becoming a, a standard. And at Roundtable, we actually now enforce it for all Roundtable personnel are required to have two-factor authentication for our Google Apps accounts uh, in order to protect our information and our clients' information. And two, so the multi-factor authentication means a combination of two out of the three things described here. So most of us have, have always just been using the first one, which is something you know, a username and a password. But you can combine that with something you have, which in most cases is going to be your smartphone with either something that gets texted to you or a, a six-digit code or an eight-digit code that gets changed every 30 seconds. It could also be a USB key. It could also be a physical key, um, you know, something you have with you. And then the third thing is something you are, fingerprint, voice recognition. Most mobile devices, as I'm sure many of you have noticed, now support biometric or, or something you are authentication, meaning you put your fingerprint on it. Using multi-factor authentication in in my estimation, is something that everyone should be doing now. And if you're not already doing it, you're going to wind up being forced to do it in the next year. So you're, it's better for you to get out ahead of it and start getting comfortable with the concept now. I can't emphasize that uh, more strongly. And on to the next thing to, to kind of reinforce that point, uh, PCI compliance. And, and for those of you not familiar with this, it's basically a regulatory standard around how we collect and manage credit card data. So if you are receiving credit cards via your website or via a point of sale system at, at one of your uh, storefronts, if, if you maintain storefronts, at uh, if you, you know, collect donations via your website, things, um, you are, are subject to PCI compliance. And as of November of this year, Anybody who has administrative access to environments handling credit card data is required to use multi-factor authentication. So when I say this is becoming a standard and will be required, I'm not just making that up to scare folks. It's not FUD. It's literally being written into regulations right now. And that takes us on, sorry for that little bit of scariness, um, and we'll lighten it up a little bit now. We're not going to scare next... you, but... Yeah, we're not going to scare you, but that is really true. <laughs> so fish, not a fish. Our third one, and let's put up the uh, let's put up the sample website. So everybody, take a look at this. You, I'll give you a few seconds to take a look, and we're kind of hoping that people are getting the hang of this. This is our third one. We'll have one more after this. Our final fish, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll and see what people think about this one. Do you believe that that is a fish or not a fish? And the votes are coming in. And the votes are coming in, and they're very consistent. This is like a uh, this is like a Trumpian kind of uh, <laughs> kind of poll that we're taking here. And we will close the poll, and we're going to share the results. And good job, everyone. Good job. Good people recognize. So first one, the first fish we threw up there, we had 37 people that missed it. The second one we threw up there, we had uh, about 20% of people missed it. The third one we got up there, 100% of everyone in this webinar just got it correct. So this is, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get all excited, but when we say the best security webinar ever, you guys are getting better <laughs> already. So take that for what it is. And with that, I'm going to hand things off to Death. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's talk a little bit about where it is. So um, we, again, have the forged URL. So even though eBay is in there, it's, it's certainly not you know, ebay.com. Uh, there's no HTTPS again. That's a big warning if you're asking, being asked for a login or any kind of credentials. And things that might be a little harder to notice, but are good things to keep an eye on. And the font and design elements are actually quite different from the real eBay screen if you take a look at it. And the graphics are low resolution. So those are other things to look for. And now, Destiny, take it away with okay. remote and travel. So one of the things to remember particularly nowadays with the usage of mobile devices, with tablets, with travel and everything else, is that our data 
comes with us. It's not back in the day when you had a big, huge computer sitting at your desk in your office, and when you left the office, all of that stayed there. Now, with cloud accessibility and mobile device accessibility and everything else, your data is always on you. So we want to go over a little bit of, of, of best practices for remote working. In other words, when you sit down at a computer that is not your own and access your information, and then also when you travel, be it on vacation or to and from work or just going out to lunch, how you can also protect your items. So, of course, some of the things that we already talked about by making sure that you have multi-factor authentication on your accounts and password set on your mobile devices is the actual awareness of your environment. So things like if I am in a restaurant and I brought my phone with me, when I stand up, check the table, or when I get out of a car or a cab, look at the seat next to me. Do I have my phone? Do I still have my tablet? If I'm going somewhere with my laptop, don't leave it on the desk when you go out to lunch. Make sure it's secured or in your hotel room, put it into the safe. Or in your car, don't leave your laptop bag on your front seat. Put it in the trunk of your car. And also, one of the things to be aware of if you're in an area that has large public parking lots, that thieves know that people do put laptops in the trunk of their car and they often wait to see people who pull into parking lots then open up the trunk and put their laptop in at that time. So these are things that you might want to take that extra moment to think about in advance. Same for those of us who ride the subway where you know that there's been an escalation of people grabbing phones and tablets from folks as they exit the train. So again, keeping your hands on your devices and having that awareness of what's going on around you is really helpful. When you are working from a machine that's not your own, try and make sure to log out of any sessions. If you've logged into something, don't just close the browser window. Make sure you actually utilize the log out button. And if you've enabled the multi-factor authentication for that particular site, that's giving you that extra layer of security that the next person can't get into it. Uh, you also want to be cognizant of the machine itself. How many people have access to it? Is it possible that it doesn't have the proper malware or antivirus protection that if I'm logging into sensitive accounts, such as my banking or credit cards, that there may be someone or a way for this machine to capture that information? So moving on to the next slide, talking to about our mobile devices themselves, which I just covered a little bit of, is protecting your device with a password at minimum or enabling your biometrics. We will talk about encryption a little bit later on and how you can protect your data that way. Again, keeping your eyes on them. And then looking at programs or apps such as Find Your Phone or Find Your Tablet where if it's lost or stolen, you can use it to identify the location of your device. The other thing that you want to do is disable services that are not in use, such as your Bluetooth services, so you don't give another level of egress to your data on your device by people who might be able to connect to it, either via an unsecured Wi-Fi network or open Bluetooth. And going on to the next slide, about wireless networks. Everybody loves to be connected all the time. But there are some real security risks about doing this. And the biggest one is connecting to open or unsecured networks. So whenever possible, if you can connect to your 4G data plan from your phone and get onto services that way, that would be beneficial. If you are using a free network such as Starbucks or in this particular scenario, Shake Shack, Typically, they will have a secondary page that is a sign-on page. So once you've connected to it, it will bring you to a web browser that will have a second step in the connection. And this, though you can spoof Wi-Fi connections, does give you a little bit of the extra layer of security. And typically, you will notice spoofing again where somebody has like the Star Lux network or you know that you've connected to Starbucks before and this does not look anything like the normal connection, use that spidey sense again. And if you must sign on to these open networks, think about the kind of transactions or information that you're going to use. Do you really want to log into your banking site 
or into your credit card site over an open network. So sometimes it's best to resist the urge to connect to these networks unless it's absolutely necessary that you do so. And I'll and, just add very quickly, Destiny, uh -huh. if you're using two-factor authentication on those accounts, then you've reduced the risk of logging into those things while on Wi-Fi networks because that second factor is not something that will get transmitted um, or it will get transmitted, but it doesn't matter because it only lasts for 30 seconds. So it's uh, that's a quick way to improve. Go ahead. Sorry. And the other thing is if your device is lost or stolen, Joshua, I'm going to hand it over to you for encryption. Okay. So uh, encryption is the most, so key term here, I forgot, we, we never contextualized our key term slides, right? Encryption is the most effective way to get data security on your device. So to read an encrypted file, you have to have a secret key or a password. It's essentially, you know, the, the data is scrambled and it can't be unscrambled without the algorithm that knows what, you know, the code to unscramble it. And if you, as we go on to the next slide, you definitely want to encrypt your mobile devices if you can. And on the average iPhone, any newer iPhone or Android phone or laptop, computer, MacBook, or PC, you it's usually just a toggle switch and then a restart to encrypt the data. And you won't really notice any difference in how the device functions or, or how it works or anything like that. But now, if your laptop or your iPhone is stolen or lost and the data on all on that is safe because even if you know they can't crack your password if you're using like a biometric code it's going to be even harder and without that password they have no way of unlocking the data on it so even if they take the hard drive out of the laptop the data is still encrypted so the bad guys can't get to it so encrypting your devices is a great way to protect your data while you are traveling and we strongly recommend that everybody do that. And with that we're going to go into our final fish. Alright, here we go. So final fish. Let's take a look at the this website. Everybody take a nice little look at it and we're going to give you a few more seconds and this is your last chance. Make us all proud. Tell us, is this a fish or not a fish? And the votes are coming in, and we'll see. And let's see how people are doing here. We're going to close the poll up, and we're going to share the results. Sorry, hang on. And oh, almost perfect. We have a couple of people who missed that one. That was a little trickier. Just so people know, we actually. Uh, I'm not sure what your experience of it was. We tried to make these a little harder as they went on. So you might think we tried to make them easier so that it would show how impressive we were at getting people's scores up. But we tried to make them trickier as we went through because we hoped that the training would, would help you identify them. So a couple of people still missed that one. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I broke the thing. It is. It was a fish. Uh, so oh, I have to hide the results. I'm sorry, Ben. So that was a fish. And let's look at why that was. Do we do we explain on this one why it was a Yeah, fish? we do. And I that think I know what tripped people up. And that is the Twitter.com with yep. the dot, et cetera, after it, which is another tricky thing that fishers do. Yep. And that forged URL, remember. So keep, keep looking for those dots. And one thing that we were kind of joking about is if you uh, read from right to left your URLs and look for where the last dot is, that tells you what the real domain for that website is. So all 09.info is the actual domain. It is not actually twitter.com. And that but I, I will better. reiterate that anything that's asking typically for a logon and password, the first thing you want to look for is that HTTPS. Not that every single site will have it, but that's usually the very first thing to check. I actually have a quick thing to add as well. This is not snarky, believe really? it or not. Uh, a, a commonly held kind of rule of thumb that you can follow too is if you if you get this uh, or get a link in an email of a site that you know and have been to before, rather than clicking the link in the email, just go to your web browser and go directly to the site. Because if it's a real security problem or if it's something about your account that needs to be updated, when you log in normally by going to twitter.com as opposed to clicking the link, it will still alert you that there's a problem. So that's another kind of really quick, easy way to, um, to kind of protect yourself against this. 
Remember, who initiated this particular inform piece of re this particular request? If it was not initiated by you, reverse it and then you go back and initiate it to the site. Take the power back into your hands. And with that, we're in the home stretch. So let's take a look at that a slide that we looked at before. And uh, before it was kind of what you can do, but now what you can do. And we're back again, nurture a security culture at your organization. So what does that mean? Well, since we did the Tame Your Inbox, I can't tell you the number of people both at Roundtable, my family, uh, clients with whom I work, where I've sent them an email and they've called me and said, hey, did you just send me this? Because they're verifying. And I do not say, well, of course I sent that to you. Why are you bothering me? No, what I say is, good job. Thank you for verifying. You had some doubt about whether this thing I emailed was legitimate. You called me. I applaud that. So that's a quick way to just nurture a security culture is when people do things like verify. Check to make sure it was legitimate. You make sure that that's encouraged, not discouraged. You don't rush people and tell them they have to do things now. You tell them, no, we want you to verify things. You educate yourself and others, share this webinar, share this information that we, that we did today. Protect your mobile devices and accounts with passwords and policies and encryption. And you've heard it a million times, we're just going to keep saying it. it is the one word security training, verify. All right, and we're going to just one last quick poll here, which we wanted to see at which desk does everybody feel like they're sitting at now? Have we, have we moved the needle at all in terms of at which desk you're, you're sitting at? So let's see what people have to say about whether people feel like you're secure. Now, don't just be nice to us, all right? Tell us <laughs> what you really feel like you're, you've changed desks here in this, uh, over the course of this webinar. And so you're thinking about it a little bit. I think that's okay. Take your time. We don't want to rush you. We want an honest response, and we're going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. And wow. So at the beginning, it was 50-50 split, and we have managed to move that quite a bit. And those of you who are still insecure, we are sorry. We want to help you feel secure. If we're honest with ourselves, I think we all feel a little bit insecure, but hopefully now we all have some things that we can do to, uh, to make it a bit better. And we want to uh, give a few minutes here to an organization, Fiscal Management Associates, that co-sponsored the webinar today. They're an organization that has particular uh, interest in information security because they help organizations with their financial information. And we have here uh, to, to talk with you, Stuart Cohen from FMA. Stuart, are you here? I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? We hear you just great. Stuart, go right ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, for doing this webinar. I am appropriately traumatized now and insecure. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Uh, we, one of the things at FMA, we, we do have very strong security and it's continually been growing and, and I think this is, a great, um, this is a great webinar that should be given a lot because I think a lot of people do not understand the reality of what everyone is facing today um, around security. So thank you for that and I've, I'll be very brief with you all um, just to thank you for doing that and just about FMA, I know some of the FMA our clients are on this call. Thank you for coming here. We love the roundtable people. And um, FMA, we care about controls. We, financial management is the center of our world. And for those of you who know that, that means that controls are very critical to safeguarding your resources. And technology being such a strong resource for everyone today, um, we're very grateful for the roundtable folks who can help us keep safe that way. If we can be of any help to you, fmaonline.net. Uh, feel free to look us up or ask Cohen at fmaonline.net uh, and we'll be happy to help you. With, if you have other concerns about controls that are non-technology, uh, we help organizations with that too. So again, thank you and um, we look forward to seeing more from you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much to FMA for, for helping promote this webinar and for just being friends of Roundtable and for helping out so many nonprofit organizations with their, uh, with their great knowledge and their expertise. And, Our pleasure. Okay. And so on we go. We're going to wrap up here and have enough time for Q&A. This is like we've done the best on time management that we've ever done. We finished right 
when we wanted to finish. So uh, we finally did it. We almost always run long, but we didn't today. So thank you for attending. We very, very much want your feedback at feedback.rtt.nyc. So uh, not right now, uh, but as soon as we're done with the webinar, please go there and, uh, and give us some feedback. And you can also let us know if you are interested in any of the following offers. So we, for people who came to this webinar, uh, you can get 15% off a risk analysis project where we help you think about that confidentiality, integrity, availability, look at your existing safeguards around security, maybe perhaps do some security awareness training for your staff and your organization. So 15% off of that kind of project. We've been getting lots of requests for those projects lately. So folks that attended this today, you get 15% off because, and 50% uh, off for any ongoing roundtable service. And you can check those out at services.rtt.nyc. So any ongoing roundtable service, you can get 50% off the first month. And we also, we did a webinar a month ago, uh, and a number of organizations have taken advantage of this, and they have been absolutely delighted because they're saving hundreds of dollars a month already without barely having had to do anything. So you can go to ccsave.rtt.nyc if you want to learn more about Merchant Advocate. They will give you a free credit card processing fee assessment. Basically, they can potentially reduce what you pay for credit card processing fees without you having to do anything. So that's pretty cool. If you're interested, contact us. Use the code BESTEVER. And uh, on to the next slide, Ben. And that's pretty much our wrap. We're going to do Q&A. We've got a whole, oh, yeah, thanks to FMA, thanks to Fish Tank, thanks to OpenDNS. Uh, they're in the resource. We, we grabbed uh, all of those except for the Con Ed from OpenDNS's phishing quiz. It's a 14 uh, slide, uh, 14 website quiz you can take. The template for our uh, presentation today is from Slides Carnival, and we, we like it a lot. And the resources page is next, and we'll leave that sitting up while we uh, take questions, I think. And uh, if anyone has questions, you can enter them into the questions. You can also raise your hand, and we can unmute you. And I'm going to just start kind of looking through, wow, we've got a lot of questions queued up. So at this point, just everybody knows, we are uh, done. And actually, Ben, can we go back to slide 54? Let's leave it there. Um, just so people can see all the uh, the links. There we go. Uh, so feedback, if you're going to leave, please do just take a, a minute to give us some feedback. Dusty and I really do take that feedback in and try to work with it. And, and there uh, was a notation um, that in the feedback URL, there is no period at the end. It's just dot .nyc. Ah, thank you, Dusty. And we're going to just basically take questions now. We'll probably wind up running past two as we deal with these. You can enter questions into your GoToWebinar control panel, but we are, at this point, concluded with the formal part of the webinar. So everybody's welcome to stay as long as they like, or at least until we, we leave. <laughs> but, uh, but we're uh, going to jump into questions. So the first question I see is, what about using VPNs when connected to unsecured Wi-Fi? So a VPN is actually a, a pretty good way to create a secure tunnel um, when you're going to Wi-Fi. The problem, however, can be that the actual credential for that VPN um, before you're connected, if you're on an unsecured Wi-Fi, is still something that's then being exposed to that wireless network. Um, once you've created the VPN connection, everything that's now happening is secured, but if that username and password that you're using to make the VPN connection is something that works for anything else, that's a potential risk. And uh, if anyone else has other thoughts about that, I welcome them. But that's, uh, the there are a few services that are becoming uh, more cost effective now that actually use multi-factor for authentication for um, VPN tunnels. So that might be something. Ah. Uh, I'll try to include some links here in, in the resources page. Um, I need to look a, a few of those up, but there are definitely ones that you can use an authenticator or a texter or something like that to yeah. be that multi-factor. So that would be a way around the, uh, the big concern about sending your credentials. Yeah. And we have another question. Is there any, any occurrence of a subscriber's Wi-Fi, such as Time Warner cables, being spoofed? And is it generally safe to connect to those networks in unfamiliar locations? And I would say that um, Time Warner and a lot of these service providers that do have hotspots all over the city typically will have an app for your device that will use that, that to find these secure locations. So it's probably a best practice to put the Time Warner Cable Wi-Fi app on your device and then use that to locate these, but they will also ask for your credentials to get onto them. Um, so you should, again, see that same secure information. I do not personally know of them having been spoofed, 
but again, you always want to be wary of making sure that it's a legitimate and not an actual spoofed Wi-Fi ID. In other words, if you see TWC, C dot open or things along those lines, you always want to make sure that you're finding these through a verifiable method, such as the Finder app that's provided to you by the service itself. All right, another question we have is how do we know we are safe from hackers, even though we might not have the information hackers typically look for in terms of infrastructure? So this is a pretty common question, which or, or a kind of general sense, which is we don't really have any information hackers would want, so therefore we don't, you know, do we really need to worry about security? And the short answer is everybody needs to worry about security because you, all of us have some kind of information that is worth protecting, and also our infrastructure can be used for ill um, and if, if we don't protect it, meaning if people can take over our computers, our networks, our websites, and deliver malware through them, which has happened to a lot of organizations that I know of where their websites, for example, have been uh, misappropriated by uh, bad actors to deliver malware or you know collect information, and that's obviously a really cat potentially catastrophic thing for an organization. Someone's coming to your website to, to donate money and instead they get malware on their computer and get crypto locker, right? So that's that's really horrendous for you as an organization. So everybody does need to practice at least the most basic best practices of security. Now if you're an organization that's say dealing with um, you know hostile uh, foreign countries where you know motivated attackers might be coming after you, you have a very different security profile than 95% of the organizations that are here on this webinar today. And you have to take an entirely different approach to security that is much more serious. Most of those organizations, in my experience, know who they are and, and for the most part, you know, are taking appropriate actions, but I will go back to the fundamental thing we said at the beginning, which is you can't eliminate risk. If a sufficiently motivated uh, party that has resources decides to get your information, they will. And there's really very literally you're going to do about it. And again, just look at the news. If, if the NSA cannot keep their information under wraps, Right? What chance does does anybody, you know, Home Depot, Chase Bank, uh, Sony Pictures? It's if you are going to be victimized by a motivated and well-funded entity, you're in trouble. All right, uh, but we can do a lot to protect ourselves from everything short of those attacks, and we can do a lot to protect ourselves from even those attacks, and make sure that only the, you know, most well-funded, most motivated attackers are going to get to us. Ben or Dustin, you have anything to add to that? Well, I would just say there was a, a, a second part of that in terms of infrastructure. There are obviously certain things that can be done, such as having active antivirus and malware protection on your companies or your organization's computers. There's having layers of protection when it comes to password policy and two-factor authentication uh, usage. Um, so there are things along that line where it's, as Joshua said, not going to protect you against everybody, but it's always better to lock the door, not just close it. So there are steps that can be taken to at least make the effort a little bit more difficult for people. And for things like websites and even for your mobile access points, to not leave the default administrator passwords and logons that come with your uh, wireless access points or when you set up your website, for example, you're using WordPress to change those credentials right from the get-go because that's public information and things that you can find simply by Googling what is the default password for my Linksys wireless router. Uh, so steps along those lines, even in your own home, are, are helpful. Uh, in the last question, oh, go ahead, ben. yeah, I can answer that that question. Uh, unfortunately, it's it, it's kind of there's two different sets of, um, of of devices we have to think about as far as uh, stealing biometric or storing biometric information. As far as your iPhone or your Android phone, where you use your fingerprint to unlock it, those devices are specifically designed to have a very secure encrypted. Uh, actual physical chip on the device that is not accessible by any means by anyone other than 
that actual fingerprint sensor. So those devices are extremely secure because companies like Samsung and Apple and others understand that those are going to be out in the wild. However, unfortunately, our own government has has kind of had a little bit lax security around storing of biometrics. So if it's a, uh, a, a system that is linked to a company that you have to scan your fingerprint on your computer or at a door lock or something like that, it could be a concern. But as far as 95% of the people in the world with just their biometric access on their iPhone or their Android, it's really not a secure uh, or not a security concern because it can't be accessed by any external means. So hopefully that answered very concisely. And I just want to make one quick point, which is that the, the kind of security part, like the nuts and bolts technical stuff that, that we've been talking about here for the last, you know, 10 minutes, um, you know, that's that's always changing, always escalating, always, you know, bad guys versus good guys. And, you know, we add biometric, they figure out how to crack biometric. We add two-factor authentication, they figure out how to crack two-factor authentication. And it's always, and that's always the way it's going to be. So there's nothing you can do about that. What's interesting about the social engineering, that was true the same way 200 years ago. That hasn't changed. So teaching yourself about the social side of security and just the general human you know, manipulations to look out for, that is knowledge that will serve you for the rest of your life and for years to come. Yeah. So there, There's uh, a reason you know, why the Trojan horse worked. <laughs> social engineering. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so this other stuff, you know, is where people like us, we have to work our butts off to try to stay current with the current, you know, with, with all the technical stuff that's going on. But the social stuff, it doesn't change. So learn it, learn it well. Um, another question, and my ED is always afraid that someone will hack us, is having a firewall and antivirus and password policy the best we can do? Can I tell them that? So short answer, no, you can't say that. That's absolutely not the best you can do. I would say that's the minimum that you, you could do would be having firewall antivirus password policy. I would say security awareness training your staff. I would say doing, and this will come across like FUD and trying to sell out services, but I would say doing a thorough risk analysis for your organization, identifying that CIA triad and how that impacts your information, and then what practices are in place to protect the information that is identified as critical, whether it's confidential or availability or integrity, um, and understanding what risks you face what would be the impact if those risks were realized? So what if, you know, how how easy would it be for someone to hack our website? How bad would it be if someone did hack our website? How difficult would it be for someone to get credit card information from our donors? How bad would it be for us if that information was exposed? You kind of go through those questions and figure out where your real vulnerabilities are and, and what it would take in terms of effort and cost to mitigate them. And by doing that, and once you do it the first time, like a lot of this kind of long-term strategy stuff, it's a lot easier to keep doing it. So you do an initial risk analysis, then you update that every six months or every year, you're going to be in pretty good shape. But if you're never going through that exercise, um, you really have no idea what risk you're facing right now. And I can't tell you whether they're serious or not, um, because you know, unless you've gone through that thought process, I think you really don't know. So and going back to the people side of things, to make sure that staff is trained and, and that security awareness is an ongoing conversation and having policies around, uh, again, mobile devices and remote usage and items like that where you could have great interior security, but if you are allowing staff to have access to their files and to email on their devices that go with them and you have no policy or instruction or best practices around those, that's something that needs to be addressed as well. As we've said, the people part of this is really important. And that answers all of our questions and we are now 10 minutes past 2 o'clock so I think we're going to close this out. Please everybody, I'm just going to throw the link in the chat, uh, http on slash slash feedback.rgt.nyc. Oh, whoops. I only sent it to the organizer. That's not going to help. <laughs> so please, everybody, go ahead and click that link, and please do give us feedback. We really do appreciate it. Uh, please make it candid feedback. We want to hear what you thought, how we can improve. We're, we're, for those of you who've attended multiple of our webinars, hopefully you see that we're changing things. We're trying to get better. Hopefully you feel that we are getting better. And thank you all so much for coming today and helping make the world a more secure place. Thanks, everyone.